conversation with queer identified writers about their works and lives. Welcome to Queer Words. This is Wayne Goodman, and on this episode, I have the delightful pleasure of conversing with Meg Elison. Hi, Meg. Hi, Wayne. How are you doing? Great. <laughs> Can you tell our listeners a little bit about you? Absolutely. So I'm a science fiction and horror writer living in Oakland, California. My debut novel, The Book of the Unnamed Midwife, won the 2014 Philip K. Dick Award. And my sequel, The Book of Etta, was nominated for the same, although I lost to the far superior Carrie Vaughn. Both of my novels were also on the long list for the Tip Tree Award, of which I'm particularly proud. I write short stories and essays, and I freelance a little bit for sci-fi fangirls. Wow. You're a busy person. I do stay busy, yes. Well, this is Queer Words, and I always ask people, what qualifies you as being queer? <laughs> Absolutely. So I am a flaming bisexual. I'm as bi as a bag of Skittles. I have primarily dated women in my life, and I was pretty surprised that I ended up married to a man, so now I'm in that strange tribe of queer women who are married to men and still trying to maintain my queer identity, which is it sometimes it's a struggle, so I really like putting it into my work. Well, that's interesting that you use the word flaming with bisexual. It's rare to hear those two words together. We very rarely think of those things the same way. I think because signaling for bisexual is much more complex than it is for, say, cis gay men who typically get to use the word flaming. So I try to rainbow it up as much as I can. When did you first accept being queer? I was in my teens. I had a lot of friends who were queer. We had one flagship gay at my high school, and uh, his name was Ray, so of course he was Gay Ray. And for a long time, he was the only obvious signal of that. And then one of my female friends came out, and all of the feelings I had been having about her suddenly made a lot more sense. Because I kept going in this loop, like if she was a boy, it would make sense. If she was a boy, it would make sense. And then I realized it just made sense on its own. But I went to school in a really religious, small farming town in Southern California. It was fantastic intolerant and we had to fight and fight and fight to create a GSA at our school and we were you know as much as any American kids are pretty oppressed so I feel like I had to fight for it early and just in case people don't know GSA is gay straight alliance that's right that's right okay well, who are some of your queer hero figures? Oh man, so many, so many. So as a bisexual, it's impossible not to look up to uh, writers like Colette, the, the great French novelist, uh, to the writer and publisher Virginia Woolf, and then to some of the early tragic lesbians who showed me uh, the beauty of lesbian literature, Juna Barnes, for example, Radcliffe Hall, some of the lesser read ones these days I got into in college, and it was incredibly instructive to see their work. I also had a, a long-term fling with queer 1970s poets like Erica Jong, whose work was very important to me for a number of reasons. And then more recently I learned to look up to queer writers like Charlie Jane Anders and Annalee Newitz, who are actually friends of mine, and it's so cool that I get to say that. And one of the things about living in the Bay Area is that my queer heroes who are writers are people I will run into at a coffee shop. So once again, I am one of the luckiest people on earth. Well, we're kind of blessed here in the Bay Area. We have for so many such, reasons. Yes, yeah. a depth of writers here. It's well, true. who are some of your literary influences? I'm heavily influenced by Margaret Atwood. I think anybody who's read my work can tell that. It's funny because some of my best reviews say this picks up where The Handmaid's Tale left off or this is The Handmaid's Tale but queer. And then some of my worst reviews say, well, this is just a Handmaid's Tale ripoff. So it's impossible to deny her as an influence. Also, of course, Octavia Butler, who had the same sort of shrewd eye on the future with the same grim determination mixed with a somewhat flagging hope sometimes. And I'm most pleased and most surprised when people compare my work to Butler's. Uh, I also take a little bit from Ursula K. Le Guin and Oscar Wilde, who is one of the great saints of my life, whom I will never stop looking up to, has always been the hand on my rudder as far as my prose goes. Wow, that's quite a group of people helping you. Yeah, it's not small. Well, what inspired you to begin writing? I've always wanted to write. I've always been a reader, and I think it's difficult not to want to do the thing that you reap the benefits of at a young age. So I always had my nose in a book, and I became very aware at a very young age that there's somebody in there. I, I remember Neil Gaiman saying that as a kid, he just thought of books as something that naturally exists. And then when he started reading, I think it was for him, C.S. Lewis, he realized that there was an intelligence at work in the book. Number one, I hate C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and number two, that always seemed pretty clear to me. I think because there were enough characters who were writers in some of the stories that I liked in some of the movies that I watched that it looked like a cool job. I remember when I was a kid watching Romancing the Stone and you know Joan Wilder writes books and she's so obsessed with her own conclusion she like bursts into tears over it and then her agent takes her to lunch somewhere nice and tells her how brilliant she is and then she makes enough money to live in New York. Being a writer is not like that. 
but uh, from a very early age I had an image of what being a writer would be like and I absolutely wanted it. So I was the kid who won like the Arbor Day poetry contest at my elementary school and instead of writing a slam book in junior high I wrote a Romana Clef fantasy novel where my friends became characters and my enemies became of course villains and then horrible things happened to all of them. So I've just always written and I'm very lucky to get to make money at it now. How does queerness impact your writing? There are so many stories that I have read where there is an obvious solution to certain problems and there are two things that bother me the most. Number one is a friendship that should clearly be a queer relationship where two people share a great deal more than they do with their intimate partner but because they're the same gender for whatever reason, because of the writer, because of the time period, it never happens. That drives me nuts. The other thing is monogamy. Frankly, I really hate watching a love triangle play out and say, you know what would solve this problem is if you didn't have a really narrow narrow view of what it meant to be someone's intimate partner. <laughs> So both of those things definitely come into play. Also, I've always wanted to write stories that represent the life that I've lived, and the life that I've lived has been unlimited in that way. I'm surrounded by radical queers. My next book is dedicated to the radical queers in my life, and those are the stories that I want to tell. Wonderful. So can you share with us your personal approach to writing? Are you more organized, less organized? Do you have a clear vision when you start or does it just fall out of your head when you sit down at a keyboard? So I'm not an outliner but I'm also not strictly a pantser. I have a method that I don't think I share with a lot of people. I know when I sit down to a story what I'm trying to say, which I think is the most important thing. And then I typically have what I think of as tent poles. I know how it starts, I know what the big turns along the way will be, and I know most of the time how it will end. And I think of those as like the main parts of a structure of a tent. And then the business of writing is you're stringing fabric between those poles and the fabric can be really tight or really loose and maybe you have a lot of it and maybe you don't have that much but the fabric can be anything so the filling in is what happens after. I think that's similar to what an outline process looks like but it's not a detailed outline so I've never found that it exactly lines up with that. Aside from that I typically write first thing in the morning. I think I'm at my best at that point. I don't tell anybody I'm supposed to be a moody night owl but I really can't write at night and I have a system of rewards for myself so when I get up in the morning if I'm going to write I have to write 500 words to earn a cup of coffee. I have to write a thousand words to earn my breakfast, and two thousand words earns me the right to leave the house. So that gets me to minimum word count every day. Wow, I don't <laughs> think I could ever be that disciplined. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, can you describe your body of work for our listeners? So I'm still a fairly new novelist. I have two novels out. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, my first novel was called The Book of the Unnamed Midwife. It is exactly what the reviews say. It is if you wanted The Handmaid's Tale to be more queer, or if you wanted The Handmaid's Tale to involve a little bit more triumph for the protagonist. My story is a post-apocalyptic adventure with a female hero. For the most part, my female hero travels in drag because it's not safe to be a woman where she lives. So it was the first thing that I wrote that really started to pick apart the notion of gender at its most fundamental. In fact, what I wrote was a gendered apocalypse. So in my second book, The Book of Edda, the main character is gender fluid, definitely transmasculine, and identifies more heavily with that deconstructed notion of gender that I've been trying to input in my work. My third novel will be out in 2019 in April. It's called The Book of Flora. Flora is a character from the second book who I liked very much and I got so interested in her I had to follow her story. Flora is a trans woman it's living in a collective of trans women in Missouri. Most of the story takes place in and around the Midwest once we leave. The first book starts in San Francisco and then it veers very long and long term into the Midwest. But each of those characters was, I thought, along a spectrum of queer, queerer, queerest, so that my third book will be my queerest and most daring work to date. Aside from my novels, I also wrote a nonfiction book about the retrospective of the 50 years since the free speech movement in Berkeley uh, when I was working at the Daily Californian. I've also been published in short fiction magazines. I was in fantasy and science fiction, compelling science fiction. I have a forthcoming story in Lightspeed. I've been published in lots of fun places. I'm quite proud of that. I would be too if I had all of that. <laughs> Well, where could people find your books? Uh, wherever fine books are sold, for the most part, just about every independent store in San Francisco. The Booksmith always has me on their shelf, and so does Borderlands. I know I've been found at Green Apple a couple of times because I had somebody run me down for an autograph. That was amazing. If those things are not accessible to you, books are always available on Amazon, and I don't have any issue of how you obtain them if you wish to obtain my books. Also, if you ever see me, I, chances are I have a copy of one or both in my bag because I usually carry them. You never know. Excellent. <laughs> Well, could you share with us a bit of a reading? Absolutely. 
So I have a reading of a short story for you today. It'll just be a couple of minutes, and it's about a person named Benji. The name of the story is Repossession. Mom, I can't move home. I love you and Dad, but it, it would crush my spirit. I'm fighting so hard to feel like an adult. Right. Right. I know. It's only the last little bit of my rent. I swear to you I won't ask again. Yes. Cross my heart. There came a knock at the door that gave Benji an excuse to tell his mother he had to go. It took a couple of tries to get off the phone. By the time she had said an unsure goodbye, the knock came again, more insistent. He lunged for it to stop the noise. On the other side of the door stood a short, bald man in overalls with a tweed jacket on top. Behind him were two unsmiling men with bulging forearms crossed identically over their chests. The short man consulted his clipboard. Are you Benjamin Alistair Sutherland? Yeah, that's me. Benji eyed the clipboard in the man's clothes suspiciously. I represent Great Lakes Financial Services. I'm here to repossess your education for non-payment of your student loans. The short man took a small step back and his two henchmen pushed past Benji into his apartment. They looked around the room, sizing it up. Wait, what? How is this legal? I only quit paying, like, 13 months ago. The repo man looked at him with a bored expression. Our records indicate that you've made only three payments total, Mr. Sutherland. My employer informs me that you haven't been answering your phone and that you've taken a job under the table so that we can't garnish your wages. Benji managed to conceal his shock and reached for indignance. I have not. I've been writing poetry full time. Repo's eyes went up in perfect synchronization with the top page on the clipboard. So you didn't flirt with a red-headed woman while she made your latte three days ago and telling her you were published in the New Yorker? A letter to the editor counts as getting published. The little man in the odd jacket did not deign to argue. Red is one of our operatives, Mr. Sutherland. We know you're a barista. Since you decided not to pay for the education that got you where you are today, we're gonna have to repossess it. Take it all, guys. The little man in the overalls clamped a small device at the edge of his clipboard. It looked like a little black dye with tiny green lights where the spots should be. The lights blinked. Benji began at once to feel woozy. The two larger men began to stack up Benji's books and pull his sun-faded and unframed posters off the walls. The itemized list of repossessions includes your literary affectations. Not my Raymond Chandler and, and Chuck Bukowski, you can't take that. I haven't outgrown him yet. Your souvenirs from your semester abroad. But I tell stories about my semester in Lima every day. I learned Spanish there, kinda. The memories and photos of the women that you dated by impressing them with your ability to quote bell hooks. Hey, I, I actually took women's studies. And finally, of course, your diploma. The last remaining henchman pulled the gold-encrusted frame of the Latin and monstrosity off the wall and tucked its wide, unwieldy frame under his beefy arm before heading out the door. Benji dogged his heels in a panic. He swayed on his feet, one hand to his forehead. No, man, come on, seriously, you can't. This stuff is all part of who I am. It's, it's my personality now. I need that. Come on, be reasonable. I'll find a way to pay. He turned back to the repo man. May I have your phone, Mr. Sutherland? Benji instinctively grabbed the boxy shape through his jeans. Why? I've also got orders here to repossess your wit and repartee. I'm willing to bet most of it is on Twitter. Benji's pulse pounded in his ears. What's wrong with you, man? How can you do this? Don't you have a soul? The repo man chuckled, swiping Benji's phone over the little black box at the end of his clipboard. The device beeped and the phone rebooted in his hand. He held it out for a moment, then pulled it back as though considering. Son, I'm an adjunct professor of medieval literature. I've been passed over for tenure six times at three schools in two states. My loans will never be repaid. If I had a soul, I'd sell it for health insurance. But cheer up. We're taking your alcoholism, too. He moved the clipboard down and across Benji's torso. When he had finished, he touched the little box and it ceased its high-pitched humming. The blinking green lights went dark. Without all that, and now that you're less interesting and arrogant, you could probably get a real job. After all, I did. Benji sagged and took back his phone. He looked around his naked apartment, defeated. He hugged himself and thought of his mother's voice, suggesting that he move back home. Sign here, Mr. Sutherland. The repo man held out a pen. Benji signed. Do I... Do I have to get a real job? Can I just keep working at the coffee shop for cash? I like it there. The repo man shrugged. He stood in the doorway, pulling it shut behind him. I guess if you want to, but we took your sense of irony about it. Armed with only earnestness, Benji faced a new day. What a great story, May. <laughs> Thank you. Could you share with us a little bit how you came up with this idea? Well, as you know, I'm a millennial and our generation is uh, known for nothing so much as being crippled by endless student debt that'll keep us from ever buying a house or being happy. So I remember a bunch of us were sitting around one night complaining about making our student loan payments and we were like, well, we don't pay. What are they going to do? Come take it. It's not like a car. <laughs> and that kind of gave me the idea, like, what if they could? What if they could come take it? What would that mean? 
Wow. Yeah. You are diabolical. <laughs> Thank you very much. So can you talk a bit about your involvement in the queer communities? Absolutely. So I mean, living in living even near San Francisco, living in the Bay Area means that I immediately have entree to all of these wonderful queer communities. It means I've been able to work with uh, women's groups in Oakland. I've been able to teach classes and clinics on how to put your resume together, which is something good you can do with the ability to write, which is great. I'm a member of a somewhat secret group for speculative and science fiction writers who are queer. So we're able to share resources with each other and tell each other about calls for submission and point out where we know there are missing stairs and other problems in the community. I run a monthly salon on here in the Bay Area, mostly in San Francisco, of queer women's writing called Clitterary Salon that I'm very proud of. And we've had wonderful guest writers from all over the Bay, most of whom are also queer women, and that's been enormously rewarding. And I've been able to go to events like your reading series, Wayne, Perfectly Queer, which I was very pleased to take part in, but also pleased to just be able to attend. And I feel like I'm I'm so plugged into so much of this that I don't even think of it as a separate thing anymore. Like I can't even separate the literary sphere in the Bay Area area from the queer sphere. I'm not sure I know all that many straight writers anymore. <laughs> well, how do you use social media to promote your work? I'm a big social media user and what they call a power user on Twitter for sure. And although I've become disenchanted with Facebook, I still use it a great deal. My last day job, I don't have a day job anymore, knock wood, but my last day job was in marketing and PR. I was a social media consultant for a cryptocurrency company. So I learned a great deal in that job about the importance of monitoring metrics and figuring out what works on social media. So what I have found works is staying active, making sure you have appreciable content every day, being able to share the works of others more than you talk about yourself, and when you do talk about yourself, giving away a little vulnerability every time, that is a big trick, especially as a woman, because people expect a lot of access to you when you behave that way. But I find that it's an enormously useful tool. There are so many writers who I feel are underappreciated, not because they don't use social media, but often because they don't know how. So I'll take someone's business card at a convention or a symposium and I'll go look them up. And their entire Twitter account is buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, because I just set a bot to tweet a link. That does not count as social media use. It's an ongoing conversation and it's a community in itself. And making connections with people who are in your lane, people who have, say, a rainbow flag in their collection of uh, emoji in their bio, looking for people who have a reason to connect with you and finding a reason to connect with them is the most useful part of it. And I know it can also be an absolute trash fire and I've had some of the worst experiences in my life because of social media, but also some of the best. And I have loads of friends I wouldn't have met any other way and I've certainly sold books by doing doing that. Great. What do you like to read? I like to read just about everything. I know everybody says that, but I just finished The Consuming Fire, which is the second in the new series by John Scalzi. I went back and reread A Prayer for Owen Meany, which is my, my girlfriend's favorite book, and she said it reminded her of me, which I don't even know how to take that. <laughs> I also read a lot of graphic novels. I just finished Paper Girls, which is a Brian K. Vaughn project. I'll read just about anything that's got Brian K. Vaughn's name on it. I'm also reading There There by Tommy Orange, who's a local writer here in Oakland, uh, and he writes specifically about the experience of being native in Oakland, which is something that I have not had a lot of contact with. And it's been really moving, really eye-opening. Also, there's a certain other native novelist who I used to recommend all the time who I am trying to pry out of my vocabulary. So it's nice to have replacements for that. Can you talk a little bit about your current project? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot of current projects. Oh, I, okay. I, I, I thought you were reluctant. <laughs> no, I just wanted to pick one to talk about instead of like the seven that I'm oh, working on. Okay. My current project is I have a full, and I've never done this before, but I have a full outline for a novel. I outlined it because I'm trying to write it in three weeks flat. That'll be the fastest I've ever written a book if I pull it off. It's about my hometown. I come from a little town in Southern California that has a curse on it. And the curse specifically keeps people from leaving. So when my friends and my partner and I decided to leave Hemet, we had to die to do it. So there's a story to be told there, and I figured that the best way to tell it is one of those stories where people who have grown up go back to the place where they're from and encounter their former selves and deal with what their memories mean to them and try to make peace with it. And of course, what better way to tell the story of a cursed town than a horror novel? I keep thinking about what happened with Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and how it came to define Savannah. It's an entire vibe. Well, are you going to change the name and location? No. Oh, you're gonna, it's, I'm going to tell the truth. Uh-oh. Yeah. Okay. Cause... You can't be sued by a city. I looked it up. Oh, okay. Well, you, you've done, obviously done your homework. 
Well, do you have any words of wisdom to pass along to other queer writers? A few. I think, especially when I was younger, I think that I decided that it would be impossible to tell the stories that I wanted to tell because they were too weird. And I want to tell aspiring writers, but especially aspiring queer writers, that there really is no such thing. Your story can be just as weird as you dream it to be. And anything you come up with, I can point out that there's weirder out there. You asked me what I'd been reading recently and I forgot to mention Every River Runs to Salt. And every time I have a story idea, I think about Rachel K. Jones. Every River Runs to Salt is about a woman who is part glacier, who steals the Pacific Ocean. I'm never going to do weirder than that. And if you think you're writing weird queer stories, you should read Chip Delaney. You should read Jim Varley. You should read Joel Gomez. There are so many of these writers who came a generation or two or three or seven before you read Oscar Wilde, for the love of God. And you can't be too gay and you can't be too weird. You can always work that in. The other thing that I would recommend is that you don't worry about writing actual sex into your stories. There have been loads and loads of queer books that I've read, particularly where the pairing is female-female, where we just sort of gesture vaguely at the fact that they're in bed together and then pan to the window so we can watch the curtains blowing in the breeze. Write the actual fucking, for the love of God, do you, do you swear on your podcast? <laughs> Yes. Great. Write the actual fucking because we know that it's happening and there are so many kids who grow up without any, this is crude, but any spank make material and any idea of what real gay people do in bed. Write it, make it part of your story, make it as queer as you want to make it. Write characters who are fat and disabled and non-white and queer. Write people that you actually know. Just let it all happen. Just get out of your own way. But that's always my advice to writers. Well, thank you, Meg Ellison. Thanks very much for having me.